Peter Frampton is a classic rock guitar god who rose to international fame in the late 70s with his chart-topping double album, Frampton Comes Alive. Frampton, who had previously played in English rock bands The Herd and Humble Pie, is known for making his guitar sing through his trademark talk box. This month, Frampton is releasing an album of instrumental covers that feature some of his favorite songs, like this version of Radiohead's Reckoner. I caught up with Frampton recently to talk about his new album, Frampton Forgets the Words, and how the songs he chose provide insight into his expansive 50-year career. Songs like Loving the Alien, a David Bowie song that Frampton says is a tribute to his childhood friend who helped revitalize his career. And George Harrison's Isn't It a Pity, which reminds Frampton of the time he jammed with George in Abbey Road Studios while Phil Spector looked on from the control room. And he also talks about how becoming a pinup sex symbol in the late 70s almost sidelined his career. Plus, we chat about how managing an inflammatory muscle disease has impacted his writing and playing. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's my conversation with the great Peter Frampton. Congrats on the new record, by the way. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I was really surprised just by the decision to do an instrumental so long after the first one, right. which was really well received, Fingerprints, and then to make it covers this time. Yes. What drew you to this idea? Well, first of all, like I grew up, my first guitar hero was Hank Marvin of The Shadows, and they were all instrumentals. They were the backup band for Cliff Richard, our English Elvis. So I started there. And I've been through all my different different guitar players I've listened to and, and everything. But I, I got to the point where I knew I wanted to do a, a, the blues album, which was the album before. But I had been diagnosed with my, my uh, IBM, my muscle inclusion body, body myositis. And uh, there's a time limit on how long the fingers work, unfortunately, with that disease. So I got off the tour with... We, the band, took, we were on the bus on the way home, I think, to Nashville. And I said, we need to go in and do a blues album. Because I'd been playing all this blues with Steve in his show, Steve, Steve Miller. So he said, yeah, I said, it's got to be covers because I want to get as much recorded as I can in the shortest space of time. So once we'd finished the blues album, I said to the guys, Let's do an instrumental record of, of, again, covers. So I didn't have to write so that we could just launch right into it. Right. And I said, I don't care because I love, I've got so many favorite melodic and, and not so melodic songs that I love that I would like to, you know, play them anyway. And coming from the Hank Marvin school, I pretty much knew how to do that. Well, it's funny. You know, I hadn't considered that. I, of course, I'd, I'd read a bit about your IBM and, and that limiting your guitar playing, but I didn't think about how that might affect your writing. Is it just that you can't exert the energy writing when you want to, when you have to play? Yeah, it, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, you can or you can't, you know, it's, you can't do both at the same time. So it's, but the thing was, while we were doing the instrumental record, it was so, and the blues record, I was at home then on the time days off or whatever, I started writing and I've been writing ever since. So, you know, the next record that comes out after this one will be a new solo record with all new material. Great. So you still, you can still write, you still like to do it. And every day, you know, I, I mean, I, uh, I've got to this point now in this world we live in the COVID world. And, um, so it's just me. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, when I actually speak out loud, it scares me. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at the TV and I say something like, who the hell was that? You know, and it's me, you boss. So anyway, yeah, so I, I, I go down, make my coffee before I, I work out every day. And uh, because of my uh, muscle thing. So while I'm waiting to, to work out, I got my legal pad in on the kitchen counter and... I write my dreams or I write what I'm thinking. I just, you know, free my mind and just whatever comes out, I write down. It looks like rubbish, but then when you go back and you read it and you go, oh, I like that bit, you know, and it's, I do that every day now. So, wow. and then 
you know, I'm writing, I tend to write the music more at night. You know, when everybody stopped working, I start to enjoy myself. When it's dark, I like to play guitar. <laughs> right. That's, that always seems to be, that's when the muse comes. Yeah, when, you know, exactly. It's dark. Yeah. Is there a connection between the dreams you write down in the morning and then what comes at night? Is there, is there a through line that you can find between the two? Not always, but sometimes, yeah. I'll, I'll pick a line from what I've written in the morning and, you know, start well, maybe that's the first line of a verse, or maybe it's, it's the second line, or maybe it's the chorus. I don't know. That's the beauty of it. That's the enjoyable part, is trying to fix it up well. And the laborious part sometimes is trying to fix it all together, you know? So, yeah, I'm, le- I'm still learning so much about writing and trying to write in a different way. When I sit down to, an is- when I pick up an acoustic, say, and I've got a regular tuning or a, a, an open tuning. And I usually go to my standard kind of things that I do every day. Then I'll just go, let's tune this one different here. And I'll just tune that different there and tune this one different. I don't know what the tuning is. Oh, that sounds good. And then I have to find the chords. And all right. of a sudden, there's notes in there that become so inspiring. It's like the Joni Mitchell uh, 101 of, of songwriting, I think. Uh, I did read somewhere, I'm not sure if it's true, but oh, we love, we love Joni Mitchell. Oh, my God. And um, that she said there's certain songs she can't play anymore because she can't remember the tunings. So I, <laughs> I, I can believe it. So what I do is when I do change a tuning, on my phone, you're like, we all record on the phone. I just put the tuning down on that day. So I know when I go back, I look at the date of the bit and there's the tuning for it, you know, so. You can, you can match it. You're never, you're never losing your way. <laughs> no, no. I learned from Joni Mitchell's mistakes. <laughs> Not that she makes mistakes. <laughs> well, you know, no, no, those are, those are wonderful mistakes that she's made, mm-hmm. of course. So how did the song selection happen for the new record? Like the blues album, I just said to the band, why don't we all make lists of our, you know, favorite songs, you know? And so I, it was just, basically, we all chose it, you know? I mean, favorites of mine, Stevie Wonder's I Don't Know Why, which is a very unknown track. I had loved that for multiple years because he's obviously majorly in love at that point. You know, I don't know why I love you, but he starts off very plaintive, And throughout the song is repetitive all the way through. And then he just lets his emotion come out. And he's, it's almost like Lennon doing mother, you know, he's screaming at the end, you know, and I just thought I I want to do that with guitar. So, um, and see if I can pay tribute to the wonderful uh, Stevie Wonder. There's also songs like on your record, Reckoner by Radiohead. Yes. I'm curious why you chose a song like that. Very interesting to hear Peter Frampton do Radiohead. And then how did you think to approach it melodically? I mean, it, it is very melodic. I mean, and, and uh, the makeup of the, the, the chords for that song are just, it's a classic. It's, it's just one of my all-time favorite songs. So I wanted to be as close to Tom York's vocal uh, melodies as possible, at least at the very beginning. And then, as I said, one has to make it a little bit more interesting. Not that you can understand what he's singing about anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but it just had to be get more interesting as it went on. And uh, it was one of those tracks that we didn't, to be honest, I didn't know whether we could do it, whether it, we could do it justice or not. And then it turned into my, I think it's my favorite of the album. So and that's why it became the first track we released with the video and everything. So, but Radiohead never stands still. They're always uh, painting a different picture from a different angle. It's just, I admire them so much. All of them wrote, they all write, you know, so. Yeah. Um, it's just one of those bands that, you know, wow, I'm glad those guys got together. <laughs> yeah. Well, how come you didn't think you could do it justice at first? What was the hesitation? Well, it's like with all of them, it becomes a challenge uh, because Radiohead fans are very protective of Radiohead. And I, I understand why, you know, because 
their version is the definitive version, obviously. And I've read a, a, a few reviews by fans that have said, I wasn't sure whether to listen to, you know, what, what I would think when I, but he said, this is the best version of, you know, a Reckoner or a Radiohead song I've heard. So hopefully, I think I, I got across, I took great care. Like, usually I come to the studio with one of my babies and I take care with my baby. Well, I would take care with everybody else's baby on this album and make sure that we treated it with respect and and didn't take it to a place where it it would be just abhorrent to anyone who knew the uh, the original that well. Yeah, I mean, you guys are not shy away from picking, you know, just beloved, beloved artists. You know, Jacob Pistorius, Marvin Gaye, Sly and the Family Stone. All of them are fantastic songs. Not all of them are classics necessarily in the catalog. Like a no. song like Marvin Gaye's Heartache is not like a, it's not a, it's not an obvious choice. No, Marvin Gaye's song was, it was actually, see, Motown was almost bigger. I believe it was bigger in Europe and especially England before it was that big here in the US. And so they released a lot more singles. So that one by Marvin was was released as a single and was a hit in England. That guitar riff has always stayed with me. I went a little bit crazy on that one. I, I did that one, at most of that one at home, uh, whereas all the other ones were done live with the band. We put everybody else on that one. And I wrote an extra little piece for it so it doesn't really sound like the song at points. I was just very inspired by that track especially, but the Motown songs that were, you know, all our favorites were so uniquely written and and played. And it's the sounds and the arrangements that really get me. And the quality, obviously, at the very beginning was not, it was very, uh, it was rough to start with, but they, I love that about it. It was so great. Even like some of the Tom Tom fills, if you listen closely, the Tom Tom actually distorts the mic, but that's part of the sound, you know, and they weren't going for that, <laughs> but it ended up being that way. And, and, uh, there's something about harmonic distortion like that, that when it's good distortion, it just, it's, it makes everything sound better. Yeah, it's such a part of the charm of those early, like as late as, you know, like 67, you're still hearing some just, you know, some of those recordings sound a little bit rough in hindsight, but yeah. just beautiful songs. Levi Stubbs, I read that they would always write the song for him and put it up a tone than he could actually sing. So he would have to stretch out for, for those. But you can actually hear his voice distorting on certain tracks, but... You know, what did we do later on in the 2000s? We started distorting vocals, you know. So it's all been done before, and there was a reason why that had charm. We didn't realize we were listening to a distorted vocal. We just knew that it sounded great. I'm fascinated that there were Motown hits in England. Were there other Motown songs you remember being hits there that weren't quite as popular here? Yeah, like B-sides... We'd have a lot of double, double-sided uh, singles, you know, where like the Beatles did and the Stones did, where both songs would be hits and Motown had that too, you know. So Supremes, Levi and the Boys, the Four Tops, and Smokey and oh, so many great. Uh, it's my, that's my music, boy. Oh, I love that stuff. What drew you to moving to Nashville? I was in Los Angeles with my family there up until 94 and then... The, the huge earthquake happened. And so we moved to Phoenix because my, my, two of my children were with their mother in Los Angeles. We didn't want to be too far away. So anyway, it's too hot there <laughs> in the summer. Kids fall over and they get third degree burns. So it's beautiful. I love it. But you, it's nice to have a winter home there. So I got this um, call to by from my publisher saying, "Would you like to come and come to Nashville and write with some of the great writers there? Do a week or ten days?" I said, "Absolutely, I'd love to do that." So I did, and as I was leaving, my wife said, "I hope you like it um, <laughs> in Nashville." So I called her after a few days. I said, "You know what? The community here for music is incredible." 
I said, I've met so many great musicians and, and writers. I think that this might be a, a good place for us to move. It's a pretty collaborative town, right? Musically? Yes, it is one of those towns where you meet and you, well, it was before COVID, but where you actually meet up in a restaurant for lunch or somewhere. You go, oh, look, there's so-and-so. And they say, you know what? I've got this idea. I would love you to play on it. And I say, okay, well, you know, that would be great. Um, send me the, the MP3 and I'll, and, and I'll uh, put some guitar on it for you. Well, that, that, ha- that doesn't always happen everywhere, all the other places I've lived. It's sort of like, yeah, that's sort of like saying goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it is much more collaborative on many levels. There's all sorts of music here. It's not just country. Are you a fan of country music? Uh, so the old type, yes. I, I, I'm a fan of, uh, of the older country and, you know, just good songs. Did you, grow up, did you grow up hearing a lot of country? Well, the first song I ever learned was She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain When She Comes. So um, my dad, <laughs> and uh, what was the other one my dad taught me? Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley. Uh, Michael Row the Boat. So there you go. We got, we got a little bit of folk, a little bit of country, and a train song. So there you go. Yeah, that, that, that about covers it. <laughs> yeah. You were born to be in Nashville. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you've never pigeonholed yourself as a guitarist. You've, you've played a wide array of styles. You've played on Ben Sidron records and Johnny Holiday records, a great French pop singer, all kinds of things. Did that come from the music you loved growing up? Were you listening to all sorts of different things? As I've said, I, you know, Shadows were first, Hank Marvin, with that lovely clean Strat sound. And then, but at the same time, my parents, uh, we got the record player and it was in time to get the first Shadows album. I remember that. So I would play that. Then I'd leave the room, living room, and my dad would put on Hot Club de France, Django Reinhardt, Stefan Grappelli. And uh, I couldn't get out of the room quick enough. It was just <laughs> awful music. And, uh, you know, I'm like eight years old, nine years old, whatever. And as my kids call it, dad's listening to that silent movie music again. (laughs) So gradually I didn't leave the room because I was halfway up the stairs and I went, oh, wow, what, what, how does he play that? You know, it just, the thing that turned me off, it was an acoustic and it wasn't an electric and it just didn't have, it wasn't a Stratocaster through a Vox, you know? And, um, but then... In the end, it was it was a two album day every weekend with my dad. He'd listen with me with the shadows, and I'd listen with them for Django. So, if, if you think about that, then the next thing is you know listening to every rock guitarist known to man and the blues players. You know, Eric and Peter Green, Mick Taylor, all spent time with John Mayall's Blues Breakers, who I went to see underage snuck in and was always in the front row looking at all these trying to work out what all these guys did how they were doing it so then i got my fill of the blues and then i i was still at school and i joined a band called the preachers they were all working they were semi-pro they'd all been in big bands and and they asked me to join and the drummer gave me 12 or 15 albums and it ranged from otis blue wow um, Roland Kirk, geez, Stones. <laughs> uh, you know, it just it just went all through all these Watermelon Man, uh, all these jazz yeah. albums and everything. Mose Allison. Oh, it was the first time I'd heard Mose Allison, and the breadth of, of the the styles that I had to learn by Tuesday was enormous. So I, you know, always up for a challenge. So I, I learned all these songs that were on the list. And so I think that's when I first got this, this love of different types of, of music that, you know, to be pigeonholed in, in one blues or rock or jazz, I didn't want that. I wanted to be, have my own style. It was a mixture of everything. Yeah. And um, it finally happened after listening to so many different styles of music. We were doing the Humble Pie record with Glyn Johns you know, the engineer's engineer in Olympic, uh, the famous Olympic studios in Barnes in London. And I'd just done the solo on Stone Cold Fever, which was on the Rock On album. And I came in and we listened and 
I didn't say anything. I just said to myself, I think you've arrived. I think this wow. is you. Uh, because I had found in one solo that I had kind of put it all together. Rock, blues and jazz. Tinged, you know, jazz tinged. But just note choice, I think, is what my style is all about. That came out of nowhere. And, you know, we had been playing it in rehearsal and maybe live. But, uh, yeah, that was just one of those moments where I just thought, well, I think I, I was very pleased with that. And that was uh, something that boded well for the future <laughs> of my play. And I don't uh, stay to the blues scale all the time or hardly ever. Hardly ever, um, I would say. Yeah, not, yeah. not often. Yeah. <laughs> especially, especially in, and on this record, you, you know, it's like you're all over the place. Yeah. It's incredible. Thank you. Yeah, it's just going places that you've never been before. You know, it's every day you you hope that find a lick, make it up, hear it and change it by somebody else. And all of a sudden it becomes another one of your library of licks. Right. You know? So Rock On is the last Humble Pie record aside from the live one that you played on, correct? Yes, yes. And it wasn't until then that you felt you found your style? Yes, that That's was- amazing. I was going backwards and forwards playing blues and then a bit of jazz. And so it wasn't until that album that because it is a rock based band, the music was was rock, blues, R&B based, actually. So, uh, you know, it was just a case of putting together all the ideas that I had. And the whole thing about soloing for me is that live is the best place for a solo for me, because there's no take two. So you got to, whatever it is, you got to take it. That's it, buddy. You don't get to do it again. And in the studio, I have, to, it's harder for me because I have to get to that place where I'm not thinking, like you're not thinking on stage. Right. I'm thinking about the audience. I'm thinking about my band. I'm thinking about what we're going to do next. And so I am in a very free form, uninhibited place. And that's what I always look for in the studio. And it usually happens with the first take of the solo or after I've taken a break and I come back 20 minutes later and I've done like half a dozen solos. I don't like any of them. Um, and I come back and all of a sudden I, it'll be the first or the second take again. Wow. Otherwise you start thinking. I don't want to think when I play. You know, I just want it to happen. Another song on your new record, Isn't It a Pity?, did you play on the original? That's one that the first day I came into Abbey Road, when George had asked me to come down and do some acoustic, we all went into the control room and they'd done it the day before and they played it. You know, Phil Spector was there and, and all, you know, Klaus and Ringo and everybody was there. And I just, my jaw dropped when I heard the sound because it's not that many people on that track, but it sounds like there's a thousand people. And that's that wall of sound with, with uh, Phil Spector, obviously. When we started, I did the more country ones with acoustic. Uh, it was me sitting next to George, and then three of the uh, guys from Badfinger uh, were playing. So there was five of us playing acoustics. It's the Phil Spector, more is better, you know? Right. And in this case, it was. So I did, I think I did uh, five or six of the tracks, tracking tracks, tracking sessions. And then about, I don't know, two, three weeks later, uh, if that, uh, George called me back up and, and said, Phil wants more acoustics. So I, um, I, I said, oh, okay, I'll bring my acoustic down. And, but this time it was just me and George sitting on two stools in the Sergeant Pepper room in, in Abbey Road, I think it was anyway looking through the glass at Phil Spector. <laughs> so we double tracked what we'd already done on the five or six that I played on. And then uh, George said, well, let's do some more on some of the other tracks, you know? So uh, that's when they would change reels and find another place for us to, to, to overdub. And, um, that's when George and I started just jamming between uh, reels being changed, which was a moment I will never forget, you know. And then he kept on putting up songs I hadn't played on and he just quickly showed me the chords. 
And I think I played on about three, four, five more, but I, it's so long ago now, I can't remember which ones I, I, I could have been on, My Sweet Lord. It's, it's most likely I am, but because there's so many acoustics on that. Each new song they put up that I didn't know, George would quickly show me the chords and off we went, you know. And um, that, was, that was my experience on that, on that record. What made you want to revisit it for this record? Well, it, it's always been one of my favorite songs of George's uh, ever since I walked in that morning and listened to it, what they'd done the day before. I don't believe there were even any vocals on it. It was just, you know, the track. And it was so haunting, the chords, and you could almost feel what the melody would be, you know. Yeah. So I thought rather than do one that I played on, let's try one that I didn't. And each one of these uh, wonderful tracks, legendary tracks that I picked, I had to be uh, very careful because um, I wanted it to be a tribute and do the very best. With George's tune, obviously, it was it was incredibly important that it be a good version. <laughs> with, like with all of them, you know, I would get nervous before all of them. But I think that's what drove me to make them as good as they came out. And I, I really am proud of isn't it a pity? I think that's it's uh, turned out really good. Kept the original vibe, even maybe even a little bit more relaxed, you know? Yeah. With George and Bowie, considering that you were friends with them, that must have been an, like, just an extra added bit of, <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah. I hope I do this good, you know? First of all, with Isn't It a Pity, yes. But then when it came to Loving the Alien, David's song, that is the song that I was given the stage to do my elongated solo at the end of that number on the Glass Spider tour with David in 87. So it was obvious that was the one I wanted to do because he gave me the spotlight right there. for, And it was an extended solo for sure. So David had given me a huge gift by um, having me as his one of his guitar players on featured guitar players on, on the Glass Spider tour, as well as Never Let Me Down record. Because David and I went to school together, and he always knew me as the musician, the guy behind the singer, you know, the, the guitar player, the lead player. And um, he saw what had happened with the Comes Alive stuff. It came out, the music is great on that, the playing is great, you know, but all of a sudden my face gets being put on the front cover of every magazine known to man and woman. And um, I got turned back into, it happened once before with the herd in England, Europe. The cuteness um, takes over, unfortunately. Thank God I don't look cute now. <laughs> and and um, became this teeny bopper kind of adulation, which was very confusing for me and for the guys, I think, in the audience. So what David did was he, he could have picked anybody, obviously, but he called me up and asked me to do it. And uh, I had no idea what he actually had in mind. And it was a gift. He was reintroducing me around the world in stadiums and then arenas as the guitar player. And I thank him every day. Really? You think of it more as a gift than that you were like a really amazing guitar player that he happened to grow up with? Well, I mean, it, twofold. I mean, I'm glad that he thought of me in that vein of being, obviously I knew he liked my guitar playing, yes. But I think more, there was an underlying reason. It was twofold. Yes, Pete's always been a great player, uh, but he's in trouble. Let's help him out here. And that's what he did. It's funny you kind of shied away from the attention you got from Frampton Comes Alive rather than leaning into it. Well, I think that initially, the majority of people that were buying the album didn't know what I looked like until they hadn't seen me, until they bought the album and they saw the cover, which is a great live shot, you know? Yeah. But I think that the girls at that point, I, I look pretty good, and all of a sudden my poster is up on every girl's ceiling or wall or whatever, and the credibility that I had with my mus musical audience don't like that. They don't like the girls screaming or whatever. And the guys get jealous because their girlfriend has got a poster of me on their wall, you know? <laughs> so, and then the guys go, well, I don't like him anymore. 
And that's that's exactly what happened. Wow. You know, uh, and I don't blame them. You know, I could have got rid of the satin pants a little earlier. Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that is a classic shot, man. That is an all-time <laughs> classic. The cover of that is, is, is about as iconic as it gets. Oh, thanks. Well, that's funny. <laughs> so I guess you essentially... You didn't want to be turned into Bee Gees. Right. The unfortunate thing was that, let's, well, let's look at David Bowie. He, he would uh, reinvent himself for every album. And Madonna copied David, you know, yeah. by reinventing yeah. herself the same way. And it was more of the entire picture because David's an actor, was an actor, a very, very good actor. And so he would invent a character for every album, basically. And he'd stay in that character for as long as he was promoting it. Whereas me, I was kind of a jeans and T-shirt kind of guy, maybe with the, you know, the jean jacket or the jean shirt, whatever. And then just started to, everyone was wearing satin pants and and sort of kimonos <laughs> and stuff like that. And I guess I just slipped into it. But instead of, you know, getting out of that, I... I I kind of furthered that by doing the cover of the follow-up to uh, There's So Much I Hate About the I'm A New Record, I Don't Know Where to Start, but it, it wasn't so much the album as, as the period mentally where I was at at that point. I have this incredible photographer was taking the I'm A New cover and uh, I arrived and put on satin pants and my little Lord Fauntleroy little sort of blouse kind of thing. And I should have worn jeans and a T-shirt, which is what I wore during the day. I, right. wasn't, I wasn't that guy in the satin pants. I was the guy in the T-shirt. And he came in. I'm sitting on the floor. He goes, click, click, thank you. That's it. And I could have changed everything right there by doing something completely different image-wise. But I've never been involved. I've never really... The image that I create is kind of there and it's, it's never been that important to me, you know. And that's where I made my mistake after Comes Alive came out. But, you know, if you look at Led Zeppelin at the time, we're all wearing the same kind of stuff, you yeah. know. And, but they, they changed. <laughs> I didn't, you know, to, for too long. And, um, Got it. So, so that, that was the situation. I thought, well, this is what I wear on stage now, as if that's it for the rest of my life. You know? But no, no, Pete, you should change it up. <laughs> <laughs> you found your look. You found your look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Okay, good. Great. Let's move on. <laughs> I do want to ask you one, one last thing. Yes. One of my favorite sides, just in general, the first side of town and country, Humble Pie's town and country. Yes. And kicking off with... Take Me Back, which is one of my, that's just, I love that song to death. Oh, thank you. That's an open tuning, right? No, it's not. It's not? No, it's not. It's, it's, uh, hold on. Let me get a guitar. This is the guitar that I wrote it on. This is my, my Epiphone. Yeah, hold on. See, it's, it's all, it's, uh, if it weren't for Paul McCartney, I wouldn't have written this or <laughs> Baby I Love Your Way because it's, I'm doing, uh, uh, so it's, it's regular tuning, but I'm doing on the fifth string, right up the top there on a G and then on the B string, I'm doing a, a B. So, but I mute some of the strings. It doesn't so sound like you're muting though. It's, ah. I'm only playing. And it was just me on acoustic. Andy Johns was the engineer. And they, Humble Pie, but the rest of them were all sitting around me playing tablas and, and percussion, sitting on the floor all around me, like hippies we were. And uh, <laughs> they were playing that, and I was so it was all picking up on my acoustic mic as well. So it's a great, great 
vibe. I agree. Yeah. Amazing vibe. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks to Peter Frampton for taking us through his new album, Frampton Forgets the Words. To hear it along with a playlist of our favorite Frampton songs, head to brokenrecordpodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast, where you can find extended cuts of new and old episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez. With engineering help from Nick Chafee, our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. The theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Peace. Peace.